excited to discuss generative AI unlocking potential. Let's take a moment to uh, ponder about the, te the te technology that uh, quite literally creates. How often do we encounter a technology or innovation that push boundaries of our imagination, that challenge challenges our very, very definition of the creativity? My name is Billy, and uh, I'm from Rwanda, as uh, Elizabeth said, and uh, my Academic journey in AI started in Edinburgh, where I did AI and computer science. And then it, it matured here uh, during my advanced studies here uh, in Oxford doing uh, advanced computer science and then MBA. And I just graduated in September. And uh, at the moment, I'm, I'm working at Mona Technologies. And uh, I'm very excited to be uh, talking uh, about this topic I'm passionate about with a uh, distinguished panel who are working in dif different areas. Um, uh, we, uh, first, we have like Angie, who's a CEO of, um, of Faculty AI, and we have Matthew, who's a CEO of Deep Blue, and we, we have David, who is a, a, a founder and CEO of uh, Offense and Robotics. And uh, uh, I'm going to start uh, asking them to tell us a bit about the, the themselves and maybe uh, talk about what, what do they understand by generative AI, so that we're on the same page. So thank you, Angie. Right, um, I'm Angie, um, co-founder of Faculty. So we're a apply AI company, so contrary to our name, Faculty, which is a homage to uh, our, our very academic heritage, uh, but we're actually a private company. We, um, so we help uh, organization to transform their um, performance through safe, impactful, and human-first AI. And we've been around for about 10 years now. Um, with, uh, we're based in London, but with just over, I think, 300, 350 people. We, I think over the 10 years, we have built and um, delivered, deployed, probably close to 500 um, AI solutions and systems uh, across both private and, uh, and public sector. So we also had our started our AI safety lab. Um, oh, there's a... <laughs> um, there is also, we have our AI safety lab since about 2016, very focused on safe deployment in commercial setting. So um, I think we're one of the few people who've uh, sort of really, with the real world, uh, experience in in doing that and today we help um, uh, we help across I think maybe more than 300 global companies organizations to uh, to, to really um, uh, improve their services product um, through our uh, our own product frontier which is a very confusing name now uh, and uh, and then AI services uh, as well as our training and in terms of Gen AI, I think that the particular is obviously we do a lot of Gen AI. We're also uh, Open AI, so the company that does the, uh, the chat GBT, uh, we're the uh, only technical integration partner. So um, because of our experience of um, deploying systems uh, in a safe way and also driving business value at the same time. So Gen AI. Um, so Jenny and I, I think I have a very simple uh, uh, understanding. In fact, we were talking about this last night, and I decided I'm going to like go on ChatGPT and see what uh, what it says. So to see if I actually got. It, it turns out it is quite simple. It is just really uh, 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 an algorithm that helps generate new content, whether it's text, images, or, or audio. And I would say that's you know. Gen AI gets a lot of attention right now, but it's just a, a small subset of, um, of, of the kind of whole big AI family, you could say. Um, and it gets a lot of attention because I think, you know, the, 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 the chatbot really captures um, how, you know, kind of the essence of, uh, of how people can interact and bring it to life. So... So my name is Matthew Larger. I'm CEO of a company called DiffBlue, which is a spin-out from Oxford University from the Department of Computer Science. Um, we're a generative AI for code company. So essentially what we do is write the tedious, error-prone, boring code that programmers don't like to do. 
Um, so, and that's about 50% of code sort of falls into that category. And that's the thing that the founders saw as the opportunity. My background uh, is in uh, Silicon Valley. So I'm from the UK originally, but uh, about the same time Mark Andreessen was trying to raise funding for, for Netscape, I moved to the US and I spent most of my career there. Uh, no golden retriever. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but essentially, you know, uh, what I bring to the party is being able to build products uh, that uh, B2B organizations like to buy. We also love B2B ARR and recurring revenue. Um, and so our customers are people like Citibank, um, JP Morgan Chase, AstraZeneca, Cisco, people like that. So we're um, about 55 people today. Uh, mostly in and around uh, Oxford. Um, and we focus on writing uh, boring test code. Um, and what that means, though, for, for these organizations is essentially that you know, we can, our system is different in that it's uh, fully autonomous coding. So if you think of like ChatGPT that everyone's familiar with, they're coding suggestion tools. So the advantage of that approach is uh, it's very easy for developers to understand, you know, auto-completion tools are not new, they've been around for decades, and essentially what they're doing is suggesting, like, what's the code that comes next? The problem with that is that you can only ever code at the speed of a human, if that's what you do, because about more than 50% of the time the code is wrong in some way, and so the developer has to look at it and figure out what to do, and maybe correct it, or reject it, and do something else. Uh, we were able to, by focusing on a, a narrower problem, focusing on writing test code, we can fully automate that process of so fully autonomous coding. So our product codes about 250 times faster than a human does, and never gets bored, it never has to go on holiday, all of those other good things. Um, and so you know, that's, that, to me, I think is the interesting area uh, of growth in the future, because that's a real productivity improvement. <clears throat> I uh, am David Hansen. I have a background <clears throat> that combines arts and humanities, actually, and, um, and uh, the, uh, the sciences and engineering with human-like robots. <clears throat> I was uh, uh, following a dream, really inspired by mm, science fiction when I was a kid, as well as uh, studies of natural history, et cetera, that uh, uh, led me to believe that artificial intelligence would change everything that would help us solve a lot of hard problems that we were facing and move on. And um, uh, so I pursued a, a career, academic career, in um, film, animation, video, um, and also uh, some AI programming and building robots, winning some engineering awards. And I went to work for Disney Imagineering. <clears throat> and I was really inspired because there were some robotics engineers there and AI engineers. Um, but this world of dreams and, um, and figurative arts coming together uh, made a lot of sense to me. And I moved into R&D at Disney, making interactive animatronics um, there. Uh, uh, getting to propose research projects, getting them funded, presenting at conferences, publishing papers. And then I went on to do this PhD that pulled all these things together, School of Computer Science, Arts and Humanities, Aesthetic Studies with uh, Neuroscience and Cognitive Science. Um, and so I built a lot of robots. Uh, the robot I'm most famous for is uh, Sophia, um, which I'll tell a little bit about. But, um, but there were a lot of robots that came before Sophia. And so um, on the screen behind, I was expecting this was going to come up <laughs> during my talk. Sorry to everyone. It sort of popped up early. But um, uh, it started with these um, other robots, like this uh, uh, robot, little, uh, this bald robot, Jules, uh, in 2006. Um, and um, if you'll hit enter, you'll see some more. Some of these are from 2002, 2003. I, during my PhD, I was making five, six robots every single year um, and doing the code for those robots. Um, and some of them, like this Albert Einstein robot, 2005, uh, went on the Kais Tubo walking robot and could actually teach physics. I was working with some AI um, in, uh, other PhD students, uh, Andrew Olney and uh, Art Grasser, a professor at the Institute for Intelligent Systems. And that robot could actually teach high school physics with open conversation. And I won the first place prize for open interaction using an early large language model of latent semantic analysis and indexing um, uh, in 2005, uh, co-shared with Andrew Olney. So these things all came together to um, uh, a platform uh, that I decided was necessary to scale um, called the Sophia Utility Platform. Uh, you can hit the next slide. So Sophia was developed as this 
just keep hitting enter, uh, enter, 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 and, and all these things will pop up. So <clears throat> it was a platform with a, a hardware for our hands and grasping hands. We released that as open source called o Sophia's Open Arms, uh, walking, um, but also other locomotion, conversation, computer vision, uh, 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 also generative um, artistic uh, uh, capabilities, all in a cohesive open source, entirely GPL platform. Um, uh, so we call this the Sophia Utility Platform. The idea hit enter, if you will. Um, oh, keep going. Uh, somehow it went backwards, hit forward, and um, that's all right. So this <laughs> this is uh, for um, the idea is to humanize artificial intelligence, um, to make it relevant to our human experiences, and turn it into a kind of figure of art. Um, so that we can examine the future. This is a kind of living, uh, if you will, physically embodied science fiction, but also a platform for investigating what it means to be human uh, from m many different uh, directions, cognitive science, neuroscience. I, and I also, I have gone back to school. I'm currently a, um, a full-time, as well as a CEO, full-time CEO. I'm also a full-time graduate student at uh, King's College London in applied neuroscience. Um, thank you. So just to talk about the structure of the session, we are going to have a, 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 a small discussion about how generative AI is being applied. And then after, afterwards, we have a Q&A. Uh, from you, you can ask us any, any question. And at the end, uh, we have uh, two, two optional two minutes, like a silence for remember, uh, because today is like a Remembrance Day, uh, which happened every year on the 11th of November. So we, uh, it's optional if you want to, you can stay here. And, uh, and, and I think we're, now we're gonna start with a, a question from each, uh, each panelist. And uh, my first question is Angie. Uh, so with the, the faculty's track record of displaying, uh, of deploying like impactful for AI system across various sectors, could you share an example of uh, where AI has just, not just optimized, but uh, transformed like the process uh, in the pu public sector? And how does this instance uh, like ex 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 exemplify the potential shift of societal infrastructure due to AI integration? Um, so, uh, something that has uh, changed uh, process and services in public sector. So I think actually optimization requires uh, changing of processes and, and, and services, just how, how organizations do things. So one example comes to mind is, um, is how we do um, patient management in hospitals. So, uh, so one of our customer, Huelda, uh, which is a uh, well um, hospital trust with about, I think, maybe 10, 10, 15 hospitals under the trust. Um, so from COVID, as you can imagine, uh, hospitals are very strained with resources. And one of their challenge is how could they create more bed capacity um, to allow them to sort of look after more patients, uh, but also providing better uh, care, like quality of care for patients. Um, so, so then they came to us um, and then um, we helped them um, actually look at the entire patient management um, workflow. So going from uh, even before patients going into the hospital, it's like, what's the, what's the likely um, uh, number of patients even going in today, say for example, if it's a Friday, we know why, uh, there's gonna be a lot of patients uh, likely to go into the uh, emergency department. Um, all the way through then, at each stage, they have to make decisions. Where should I allocate the patients, which ward? How should I um, be like doing the care and to all the way to like how should I discharge the patients? And actually the discharge is one we see like, um, well, the very first uh, project with them. And you could see a massive like kind of 30% percent increase in early discharge. So, um, so actually discharging patients is, um, it isn't, 
before doing this, I thought, oh, it's going to be very straightforward. You got the doctor signed off, you're well enough, you've got your medication, you go. But actually, it's much more complex. They have to like plan beforehand, for example, what would be the support, what would be the then the community kind of support going in, further medical support. So, so in order to have that all in place before you can even discharge the patient. Um, so then um, being able to help them through the entire kind of patient management workflow and identify patients which they could start like different stages of discharging process, just allow them to, to increase that 30%. And I think it's a, it's a very um, important process change because the, 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 the platform they're using the product is not used by like um, uh, a data scientist somewhere. This is actually used by frontline medical staff, from nurses to, to doctors, to, to manage that whole process. And I think it, it actually shows a how uh, an AI product can be used in a kind of very operational environment um, because it is designed for the users like the medical staff to use. And, um, and they obviously will have to understand some aspect of the, the kind of process change. Um, but you, I will see more and more um, technology like this going to be used by like actually people doing the real job. And, um, and I think the, the, the infrastructure it changes is very quite profound in an organization in, for example, healthcare. So Matthew, with deep blue cutting aging technology in, uh, in software development, how is AI for cold changing developers' approach to problem solving and innovation? And what does this say about the future of skill sets and the roles in the software industry? Yeah, so I think, uh, I think software development is changing probably for the better. It's essentially what's going to happen is that uh, what the nature of software development, the tasks that are done, um, will change, will shift. Um, and I believe that uh, the best application of generative AI is essentially to remove a lot of the drudgery out of it. Um, you know, I talked a little bit about the sort of productivity. It, software is this very odd industry, because it is an industry, but it's, it's more like a creative endeavor in the sense that 99.9% um, .9 of code today, even today, is written by hand. It, it's more like, you know, it's like you're going to make a movie and you start, and somebody has to write the script, and somebody sits down, and there's this huge sort of human effort around putting together the script, and from that, from from that, the rest of the movie comes together, right? It's the foundation. And software is a bit like that. Uh, and it's a supreme irony because, you know, software has automated so many industries and made them more efficient, but not, never itself. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so now we have this opportunity to do that. Um, and I think it's, uh, you know, when we talk to software developers about this, it is essentially about freeing up their time to do the more creative things, which is where humans really excel. And it is thinking more about the design of the software. It is essentially trying to use automation to, uh, to uh, give them more time for uh, things that are, um, are more valuable. Um, and that, I think, is, is the real value that we can deliver with a generative AI and software, I think we're just getting started. I think ChatGPT is great and, and Copilot from Microsoft, uh, but they're really just scratching the surface of what's really possible. Um, and I, I think um, you know there's a bright future for all of these people in software. There is still way more software to be written than there are people to do it. And that's not going to change because uh, software is now at the heart of almost all businesses have to use software in order to be competitive. I mean, some of our customers, if I think about Citibank, the thing that they wanted to get from our product is the ability to ship more frequently so they could be competitive. So in City Markets, which is the trading division of City, uh, it's about them have, being able to update their algorithms and trade more efficiently, um, and trade more profitably. And being able to ship software faster and faster and faster is how they can do that. Um, and you look at the people who are, who are leaders in this today, you know, like somebody like a Netflix. So Netflix probably deploys new code, I don't know, 1,500 times a day uh, to, to that platform. You never notice, but they're always trying new things, tweaking things 
in that platform. Most businesses don't get anything like that kind of frequency, but that is, that's the journey that they're on, and that's how this technology can help them. So, uh, David, Hanson uh, Robotics uh, um, has notably blended AI with uh, rich nuances or human expression in robotics like um, Sophia. So in, in an era where te technology is often seen as impersonal, how do you uh, envision these emotional intelligence robots enhancing human e experience, um, like especially in a sensitive area like a health healthcare or education? And what do you think is the role of embodied robotics is going to play in making generative AI um, more usable and uh, impactful? Well, <coughs> human beings, we've evolved for face-to-face -face interactions. And it's really powerful um, uh, as an experience um, for us. It's very communicative. It's a high bandwidth channel of communication. And that's why it's really wonderful to be in the room with you um, uh, connecting this way. Um, and uh, we don't get as much um, from Zoom or just say a phone call or a text message. Um, and there's a lot of ambiguity in, in, the, uh, in those simplified uh, forms of messages. And so um, I think this is uh, one of the reasons why we're, we're drawn to figurative um, arts and animation and so forth, these kinds of narrative arts. But that's m merely an indication so um, uh, of the power of of this kind of communication. So um, now we're seeing AI that's becoming more uh, effectively multimodal. Uh, so it's not just chat GPT with text or voice, which is starting to become uh, mature, um, uh, but it's also able to generate moving images. But with uh, physical robots, we can uh, provide a human-like presence in the room face to face. We can do this, of course, through um, video animation and so forth. But um, but uh, there's a special power to that um, physical presence. Uh, we've taken the robots that we've developed. Um, my team is an amazingly diverse team, really, um, you know, uh, scientists, engineers, AI, PhDs, and mathematicians, but also artists who come from this kind of um, animated a animation legacy and figurative arts legacy. Um, and that diversity of skills has gone into these robots as platforms that then were tested, um, actually deployed um, with uh, some hundreds of robots uh, that um, built on uh, tests with children with autism, uh, with a curriculum for teaching uh, social skills. That uh, was a cognitive behavior therapy. The, the, the studies were really uh, profoundly effective. And then these robots um, have been helping kids um, with, with autism to learn these uh, uh, core skills to um, hopefully catch up on their developmental pathway. And also, same thing for um, uh, tests for guided meditation uh, that were really cool, um, but that hasn't fully deployed. Um, but education, um, the robots that I've made have served in education at institutions with a lot of students doing their, their sometimes undergraduate work, sometimes their PhD dissertations on the robots as a platform, and then publishing papers. Um, and we uh, have the aspiration that these robots be mass manufactured, so we've been working towards this. The um, robots are hard, so making simulations of robots, simulation tools is really powerful, but all along the way, this is a way to connect the AI to the human experience, um, make it more valuable for people. I also like the uh, potential, since we're here talking about potential, that, um, that the AI could learn about the human experience from human beings by integrating with us socially. So in other words, from instead of just learning from uh, our data, we just dump the raw data into these algorithms. And it's learning vicariously from these experiences. Um, but it's not really experiencing them with us. If the AI is able to learn through a human-like physical embodiment in a human-like social context, maybe, just maybe, the AI can actually learn what it feels like to be a human, come to associate with us. I think that, um, that instead of just thinking of artificial general intelligence, which is speculative also, but a lot of companies are moving in that direction and setting that as their chartered goal, um, making AI that could be compassionate, that could actually feel with us. I think that this may be a way to um, to crack uh, or solve the alignment problem. So, um, so th this is uh, uh, why um, 
uh, human-like presence uh, and with some physical and robotic embodiment might be important. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, we're going to, to shift the gear a, a bit. Uh, uh, like during my, my MBA studies, uh, I came across uh, this um, framework called the Gartner Hype Cycle, which basically explained the adoption of any emerging technology. And uh, the, the, the main takeaway for me was that most of the technologies, they, they tend to be uh, overestimated in the short term, but uh, underestimated in the long term, the, the, the potential impact. And they go through the, a series of uh, uh, like trigger of technology, pick of uh, inflated the expectation, and then until like a, the, there's a plateau of productivity where they, they, they start becoming useful. But when we were having a discussion uh, last night, we were talking about like AI has had, had many winters um, over the past, since the first conference like in the 1950s. And it seemed like it's not following the same uh, pattern, I might say. Uh, I wonder, what, what do you think uh, about the potential of, uh, of generative AI? Is it being overhyped uh, or is it something different about it? The fact that also it's, a, it's the first technology which has, which has potential to, to have intelligence <coughs> way far than the, the smartest human. I, I think some of the um, regulatory uh, approaches, uh, we had the Bletchley conference like last week or the week before, uh, illustrate how overhyped it is, where you've got people worried that you know, AI is going to end the world. Um, nobody knows how this is going to happen. Technologies have to be invented that nobody knows how to do. But the prime minister is talking about you know, AI ushering in the end of the world. Um, meanwhile, the, there are you know, existential threats to technology that's already available for free on the internet that you could download this afternoon and use and uh, to spread misinformation. Um, and we're not talking about that, but we're talking about this hypothetical end of the world dystopian future. So I think... Um, I think it, it, it's a, there's a very real <laughs> regulatory uh, need and a conversation to be had uh, back to the original, our first panel here where we talked about, you know, the, you know it's not black or white. There's this, there, there is a conversation to be had here, but we're way too far on dystopian end of the world forecasts. Do you have the same feeling? Do you feel like is generative AI overhyped? So I think... AI as a technology, I see it as, you know, as those big paradigm shift, like the electricity, like the steam engine. And I think we are not quite even at a stage knowing what's possible. I mean, I'm sure when people had the electricity, they thought they just wanted light, and they didn't realize it powers the entire world and, and how it's going to transform uh, humanity. So I think we're at the beginning. Um, and uh, generative AI, as, as it is, is potentially overhyped because it's, it's actually very nascent in the whole AI kind of uh, space. So AI, we, I, I very simplistically put it into two big categories. One is algorithm we know really, really well. Like those are things that you have on your email, like spam filters, that's been around forever. Not forever, as in, you know, for, for, for a <laughs> long time. Nice. Yes. In a, in a, so these are very well understood and um, they're very useful. And um, I think they're, they're definitely a class of AI algorithms that, that does that. Um, and then you have this set, which more sitting in the kind of gen AI side, where we don't quite understand it. Um, and, but the excitement right now is very much on, on those uh, potential. And, um, and as, as Matt saying, is, is really sort of how then do we regulate thoughtfully whilst allowing innovation um, and, and progress for, for this set of things that present the, the kind of potential risk to humanity, yeah. Yeah, I think that the, the hype cycle um, uh, and the uh, AI winters um, are, are sort of two separate things. Um, and uh, there just um, wasn't enough actual um, uh, productivity from AI and the other AI uh, eras in the you know, late 1960s and 70s, and then 
than the second great AI winter. There, so to, there just wasn't enough productivity, enough, enough um, value, as you, uh, as you said last night, actually, um, uh, to, to carry um, people's belief and the funding. But now there's so much value. Uh, um, your companies are delivering real value to the world. There are many companies out there delivering value. Um, there's breakthroughs almost every day. Um, and people, of course, may not know where to set their expectations. Uh, it may, it may, I mean, from my perspective, it's impossible to say exactly what's going to happen. And so these debates happen about, about, um, about these marvels and dangers and, and, and so forth. But um, underneath all of that is the actual impact that it's having on our world. And, um, and that's not going away. Uh, that's really um, getting stronger every, every day. Um, so, so I really don't expect that there's going to be a, another AI winter. I think, I think th this is the AI springtime. <laughs> I agree. Uh, so you also mentioned about like a, the, the role of open source versus like commercial models. There have been like a big debate, like many AI experts like uh, Yan Likun saying the open AI model, they should be outsourced. Uh, and there should be there should be a, trans, a transparent so that like the public can know what's going on uh, in, in inside these models. But many companies that other, other people like Sam Otman, they they, they 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 feel like these are mo these models are too powerful and they're risky and there's so much we, we don't understand. We should take a step back and put the regulation in place. I wonder uh, what our panelists think about the role, the role of regulation and the democratization democratization of uh, AI models? Um. I, I think that um, a democratic uh, regulation is a good idea. <laughs> that um, uh, uh, right now, a lot of the regulation is coming from you know, some very uh, narrow uh, groups. So you know, some of the big nations of the world are saying, OK, don't worry, we'll take care of this. Um, these highly centralized groups, and often um, the big corporations are kind of in right in with them, saying, "Yes, uh, we're the experts, and, and we're going to help regulate." And and you know, it's obviously going to be um, serving their interests uh, as they're doing this. Um, I like the idea of a global democratic AI movement, and open source can help with that. But the problem, of course, with open source software that has been raised is that open source software potentially can make um, AI available to anyone, including um, uh, people who might do bad things with it, possibly um, uh, psychopaths, <laughs> you know, so forth. And so, um, uh, but I, that, for that, I like the idea of a global AI commons where um, there's a pool of resources. Um, uh, I like the story of stone soup where everybody from the village brings a little something and you make this like giant pot of um, soup. And if that happens with AI, pooling AI resources, then that becomes um, something that the whole world can vote over. People, governments, corporations, and, and everyone. This is sort of a dream. It's more of an, an idea. But I think it's uh, thinking in the right direction. Because then everybody has a voice in it. And it's, the world is better for it. Then you're actually representing humanity in, in its full diversity. Um, yeah, I think, I think um, I, I mean, I'm hugely uh, excited by what is going on in open source in machine learning models. Um, the stability, the, the um, image generation model, not, not the company, the, the open source project, uh, you saw huge advances in that technology um, because all kinds of people were tinkering with it. Uh, people trying to get it to run on Raspberry Pis and sort of little computers. And, so, and because they didn't have money, they made it much more efficient and uh, a lot better and easier to run, and it runs on more... Uh, types of computer now, and and it suddenly it became better than the model uh, from OpenAI, from uh, their their image generation model, because there were so many people tinkering with it, and they were able to get better results that way. And I I think um, some of the things you're seeing uh, that you mentioned, like in regulatory uh, capture, essentially, is a reaction to that. It's like you know the, the big guys who are out in head, you know, OpenAI, sorry. Um, 
you know, way out there in terms of their capability is and sort of like pulling up the ladder again. So, yeah, we should slow all this stuff down, right? <laughs> uh, and so I, yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of open source. I think open source tends to drive innovation and, and competition, which is important um, because even from you know our customers, people, to, people don't like to have vendor lock in, right? Because then you, uh, especially as an enterprise, you're like lock in for tens year, of years. I mean, look at finance, uh, uh, even the technology <laughs> lock in that that sets us back like thirty years. People still using codes uh, that they're afraid to even sort of. Uh, leave it behind and move to a better new system. Um, I think, but I, I think it is possible to have open source whilst putting guardrails around it because the it is true. Back actors, you know, now they can do things. We, we're basically given you know everybody the power of like nuclear weapon, effectively. Like anyone can you know, to, to access this and do whatever they want at scale. That is the challenge, right? So previously, misinformation is like, you might have newspaper printing wrong information, but now that actor can create that at scale, that which is, which is what I think humanity hasn't dealt with. And um, I don't know, it's, it's a great question for regulators. I think our regulators need to be more um, upskilled in order for them to put in the kind of right kind of guardrails around it. Um, uh, so yeah, interesting problem I think, for them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, so we are gonna take a few questions from the audience. If you have any questions, please put your hands up. Do we need to get Anna to ask you to get ask questions? Is that what you know? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody with that. <laughs> Hi, thanks for the discussion. Um, I was wondering, so I'm sort of in the field of data science, and you know, some of my challenges for the past year have been you know, keeping up you know, with everything that's coming up in this space of Gen AI and broadly. And I was wondering what have been your challenges thinking of the past year? You're more, even more immersed into the field, you know, and what are the opportunities looking ahead when it comes to someone really immersed in this space? Um, and maybe we can avoid the regulation challenge, which obviously <laughs> we all know about. Do you want to go first? I'm thinking uh, the, the challenge, certainly in the past 10 years, is um, almost changing the minds of organization. Because typically, organizations work in a way where, oh, what, what, what is the ROI? And in media, it's like, it, it takes a very short-term view, tends to be. Whereas this is a transformative um, technology, and to use technology like this, you, you can't just do one project. It's actually quite a, a profound change in an organization. Like, you know, when you have electricity, you know, at the beginning, people couldn't use it in factories because <laughs> they were still having all the equipment, um, the skill set of using steam engines. So even if you have electricity, you can't actually use it very well. So, so then I think certainly the, the past couple of years, you see that organizations really try to take a more longer term view. So if you ask like three, I don't know, uh, two like, like executives of organization, like two out of three would tell you they are afraid of existential, like for their organization, if they don't um, take on AI as a strategy. But at the same time, you can't do the same exercise of going to the CFO, this is what we're gonna get, and then here is uh, the project. But rather, now they're thinking more like, okay, how do we transform the whole organization? How do we make sure, the CFO actually, their job is, how do we make sure they have funding, um, capital to, to allow them to do that, to take a more long-term view. So I think that, that change of mindset like, unlocks a lot of the, the, the value of, of AI, yeah. Yeah, I think that's very true. We see the same thing. I mean, a lot of companies right now are uh, you know, been cutting back on spending. You've, you've seen all the headlines of layoffs in various industries, uh, including technology. Uh, so you know, times are tight, and in some cases, it's very difficult for these organizations to articulate the benefit in a way that something, somebody like a CFO understands. Um, we have, we've had uh, examples with uh, prospects, customers we've worked with, where we've uh, helped them build the business case that they could get past the CFO. 
um, because you know, to them it's obvious what the benefit is in terms of what day to day what they do. Uh, it's very, very clear to them. But um, when you go to the, you know, you say, well, we're going to improve the productivity of all of our engineers, um, and you know, this will save us, you know, so many years of effort across the team. And the CFO goes, great. And so, where does that show up on the balance sheet? Right. So the team's still the same size, right? You're not saying we should lay people off, and they're like, no, 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 we're not saying that. And they're like, okay, so where's the financial benefit? And so they they have to uh, upskill in how they make that case. Uh, so that is one of the mo more challenging things, for, at least for us. Um, <clears throat> for for my, thank you. For for my organization, uh, we're we're a creative organization, creative research, creative development, and um, and all of these new AI tools that are coming out every single day. It's just like a bonanza, <laughs> and so <laughs> exciting, and so it's just. You know, the, um, it's hard uh, to focus sometimes. <laughs> um, uh, and so picking out these tools and shuffling through them and trying them and plugging them in. And, um, and the results can be so amazing. They're really good. And it's just the, the hardest thing uh, it, for me is really emotional uh, because it's like there's so much potential that we can see that we just don't have the resources to realize. And the wonders that would happen if we were, if we had the ability to implement that um, it would just be astounding. And um, this is another reason why open source is so exciting because you can throw those challenges out to the community. And we've open sourced all of our code, but we don't have a huge open source community around our projects. But it's just um, it, it's the hardest thing is to is constraining ourselves to actually get the task at hand done without like picking up some new toy to play with today. It's a little different problem than <laughs> what you're describing. <clears throat> science or technology, I compare it a little bit like you had combustion engines and you now engines in general, and they went from steam and so on, and we built all this kind of stuff around us. So maybe an answer to that, how do you see it in the historical context? Because that's important for the 21st century, right? I think that's a really interesting question, um, like what it means. So it's an extension of software, yeah. Yeah. so it's not that important, it's just another kind of yeah. implementation. Um, I think it does define us. Uh, so I, I see this as um, the same as kind of like language or writing. So at the beginning of human, um, I'm thinking we don't have language. We're so limited in how we're able to be productive or, or communicate. And then you have language. You start to be able to communicate ideas much better, pass down ideas much, much better. And then I'm thinking, then after that, you start to have writing. So writing allows humanity to start being able to like, preserve those learnings to, to, to bigger audience. Um, and, and then software, as, as an, I guess, is an other extension. But I think AI is actually, um, is start to allow us to get what, I wouldn't say intelligence, but part of the kind of in how we do things in, in, in an intelligent way, I mean, I'm, I'm using it as a very broad term, to externalize it. So to, to, to almost like supercharge it in that sense. So I think, to me, certainly, I see that as more kind of comparable of like language writing and extension of the, the, the human intelligence in that sense. So, yeah. But it's a good question, so yeah. yeah. Uh, artificial intelligence, just adding on this, one of the differences is that it um, uh, is uh, biologically inspired and it's being used to unlock many aspects of biology too. Um, uh, and uh, the idea of taking these computational models of biology and running them in software and seeing them do these amazing adaptive things, and we're starting to see emergence in these algorithms, well, that revolution is only um, just 
begun. And um, so the, uh, where the technology may be alive, that would be a, a, a really a critical threshold in the history of tech technology, especially if, um, if it starts to um, uh, do things that, uh, that we would categorize as um, really imaginative. Um, already it sort of does, but uh, this gets into the um, realm of something we don't have time to talk about, machine consciousness. Um, I just said it, but we can move on. Uh, thanks. OK, so uh, I think we have run out of time. So uh, maybe, uh, maybe you can take one, one last question. And then. Um, well, license agreements, first of all. So, in our license uh, to to our with our customers, and also in the license that we put out, we um, say that uh, the license uh, depends on um, the ethical uses. So, no no uh, firearms, uh, no no drugs. Basically, a bunch uh, a bunch of these kinds of terms, and um, <clears throat> and then we see it as um, really. Uh, you know, curated by the community. Um, uh, but um, the robots themselves, of course, are actually quite expensive. And so uh, they'll be expensive for a while. Um, and that, that uh, means that not many people um, have them. Uh, the source code, however, of course, could be used with third-party robots. Um, so being totally open source, you could put it, uh, put it into also, you know, virtual characters. Um, <clears throat> and this, this is a really good pro uh, uh, question um, that we haven't answered fully. How can we ensure that everybody um, acts ethically? Well, I mean, we're, we're humans. I mean, we're worried about are the future of machines. Are they going to treat us well? But we're humans. We're not necessarily treating this planet very well. So we have to figure out how um, not to um, just get smart, smarter as a species with these technologies, but how to get better, more um, uh, morally mature as a species? How do we, how do we grow up? And yet, um, I think the playful heart is part of that. You, you, you know, it's not about like shutting down the fun of being humans in this time. It's about opening our minds up and opening our hearts up. Um, and, and that's where maybe the most ethical behavior uh, can come from. Uh, I think we have less to worry about if we can make a safe uh, space for humans to be our best. Thank you, David. And I'd like to give uh, to say thank you very much for your time and for your insightful like uh, information you gave us, and for your, the audience to, to participate. And please give a round of applause to our. <laughs>